Good morning. Welcome to worship with us on this Lord's Day. And, uh, to, to, and welcome, by the way, to those, of course, who are, I'm talking to and are seeing me. And uh, welcome to those who, who I can't see, but are seeing us uh, watching online. Glad that you've, you've tuned in today as well. Um, typically this summer, my own personal uh, scripture reading in the mornings have been in the Older Testament, uh, particularly historical books. Uh, but on Sundays, I, I, I always want to read something from the Gospels. And so this morning in the Sermon on the Mount, these lines really gripped me and, and struck me as, as good for, uh, for us to be hearing God's call to us to come and to worship him. It's from uh, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7. And Jesus says this in verse 7. He says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. And, and certainly when we come together for worship, it is a time to be seeking God, to be asking of God, to be knocking and asking God to open doors for us. But always the, the context in which we can, can do that uh, begins with praise, with acknowledging who God is and what he's done for us in Christ. So let's do that. Let's praise him and let's do so in song. If you're able to, would you stand with me as we sing?
Hello. Good morning. Ah, there you go. Here, here he is back visiting, and we've put him back to work already within minutes. <laughs> but I was also encouraged this week as I read um, through Philippians. And particularly, I was, I was gripped by Philippians 4.4. 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and mind through Jesus Christ. Um, and as we come later to confession and then to our prayer, it's great to keep that in mind that through prayer and supplication, we bring our requests to God and, and he answers them in his time, um, not always in our time and when we want him to, but he, he, he answers them in, in due time. Um, but before we get to that, I think we have a few announcements. I hope mine is synced with that, but we'll, we'll find out here in a moment. Um, in-person worship services, six o'clock on Saturday and um, 9.15 and 10.45 uh, here in the, in, the, uh, in the sanctuary. And online, it uh, begins, the live stream begins on Facebook, YouTube, and our website at 9.15. So this morning at 9.15 when we started, those that are joining online were able to see. Um, and we have, I think, on-demand services as well. Um, cleaning, we're looking for some volunteers to help clean after the services, just a few minutes to wipe down pews. Um, and if you're, that's something that you're able to help us with, uh, please let one of the staff know or you can email the office um, and let them know or you can actually even call the office as well. I think Corey's in there um, most days now. Um, Moraine, North Shore, uh, hike and bike. I hear uh, Bill is very, very hard to keep up with uh, on that. So, uh, but if you wanna try, go ahead. I think they're meeting the next time, uh, August 9th, and that's gonna be at five, the North Shore parking lot in Moraine. Um, prayer request, I don't have that. <laughs> um, Prayer request, uh, it says all the school's food was stolen and needs to be replaced. Um, and this is one of the um, ministries, I believe, in uh, is Sudan. Sudan, yeah. Uh, and uh, for Yasser and his family, uh, his son has hepatitis, he has malaria, and their bikes were stolen. I believe that's their primary mode of transportation is bicycle. Otherwise, they've got to walk quite a significant distance. So um, please be praying for that. Uh, for that ministry and for that family, um, that God will intervene there and help out in that situation. And, uh, and anything else we can do there, I'm not sure what else, um, what else is going on with that, but uh, we'll find out. Um, Saturdays at 6, I have the um, eclectic music style in the fellowship hall. Um, is that still going, Bill? Uh, it is, and we may shut it down for a little while. Okay. But it will be, but it will be especially in the fall, we'll be starting up with All that right. again. Fall, we'll be starting that up again if it does shut down for a bit. But um, for the time being, it, it's going on, and I guess we'll have further updates as that goes along. Um, so as we enter into, into prayer and confession, um, we'll have our confession up here on the, on the uh, board, and we'll read that together as soon as we get there. <laughs> I think I'm a little behind what they're doing up there. I, I apologize. Um, but while we're waiting for that to come up, offering. Um, the offering plates, I believe, are outside the doors uh, right when you came into the sanctuary. They're out there. So if you can give, um, please do so. Uh, it's uh, it's a, a good thing to do uh, to give and to, uh, uh, to allow that uh, ministry to, uh, to continue on through your giving and your donations. Uh, so now that I'm caught up, um, if you would read with me, please. Um, the confession of prayer, and then we'll have a silent moment of prayer after that, and then I'll, I'll finish this up with an with a open prayer. So, gracious God, our sins are too heavy to bear, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what our sins are not for us is a soothing fire.
Father, we're truly blessed to be able to come together today and, and worship in your presence, in your house, with fellow believers. We're just so, so honored. We're just so privileged for that. Lord, our world is struggling. Our world is hurting. You know our need. You know the needs of our world. You know the needs of our leaders that are leading our world. Lord, we ask for your guidance and your wisdom for those people that have to make difficult decisions for the lives and future of, of people. Schools are, are, are trying to decide what they want to do, whether they want to open, whether they want to stay closed and online. Lord, intervene there and, and may your wisdom shine through those that have to make these tough decisions. And Lord, for ourselves and for our community here in Grove City, we just ask your continued blessing. We've been very, very blessed to um, not be really feeling the, the horrible effects of COVID as some other uh, counties and some other places have felt, Lord. And, and we just ask your continued guidance and blessing for our local uh, governors and our local community. Lord, we're just so thankful for all the blessings that you've given us for the blessings on our lives. We're just so thankful for all the work that you've done through your, through your people all over the world. For Yasser and his family, Lord, we had a prayer request for them um, in the Sudan where they had some supplies stolen and, and there's a need there. Lord, we know that only you can intervene in that situation and only you can, can bring satisfaction to that, to that scenario. And Lord, we just lift that family up and that ministry up to you and the other ministries around the world, Lord. We just lift them to you and, and ask for your guidance and your, your intervention there, Lord. For Bill today, Lord, as he delivers the message that you've laid on his heart, bless him, keep him, and may we be filled with your spirit through everything he's had to say. And Lord, we pray now that prayer that you taught your disciples by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Amen, indeed. Bob, thank you. Thank you much. I must say, though, I'm a little jealous. I, I wish I had a shirt like that. But I know even if I did, my wife wouldn't let me wear it to church. So I, I, I'm jealous on a lot of levels, you know? I was told it's salmon. No, salmon. Okay. All right. If you say so. <laughs> yeah. And Bob also, Bob mentioned, and you saw on the screen, uh, prayer for Yasser Makari. Yasser, some of us have met him. He was here about two years ago. Uh, he's man, Yasser has a wonderful, wonderful ministry in Sudan to refugee children. Um, they, they built a school for refugee children. And, um, and, and again, that they've, they've had their food stolen, you know. Uh, that's, that's just really, and, and again, as, as Bob said, having a bicycle stolen there, it's like or having a car stolen uh, because that is their main means of transportation. So please be lifting Yasser and his family in prayer and, and also uh, just for the effectiveness of, of their, their ministry to refugee children there too in the Nuba Mountain region. Well, today's scripture, Joshua chapter 20, and I, I know that... Um, been in the summer kind of a hodgepodge of things throughout uh, the Old Testament. I was in Joshua last week, and I, thought, and I thought, well, gee, I should do something else. But then I realized that Dave Valentine's speaking next week, and he's speaking on Joshua because he's been preaching through that uh, this summer at a different church. And, uh, and so I thought, well, let's, let's just have a Joshua theme going here. Um, th this Joshua chapter 20 is sort of the tail end of, of a longer a section of about, about eight chapters, really, that is about the, the divvying up of the land. Um, you know, which, which land goes to which tribes in Canaan. And um, uh, honestly, for the most part, it's kind of dull reading, <laughs> in, unless you really drill deep into the history and the geography of it, because it's, you know, it's about a lot of you know, places and people and boundaries and stuff like that. Um, but this chapter 20 is sort of the one of these things is not like the other part of it because it's about some land that isn't for a particular tribe, but for people, for people throughout Israel who are in trouble, who are on the run and in danger of being killed. Listen to God's word, chapter 20 of Joshua. Then the Lord said to Joshua, 
Tell the Israelites to designate the cities of refuge as I instructed you through Moses. Now you can read about this in in Deuteronomy and Numbers where, where this original instruction was given. So that anyone who kills a person accidentally and unintentionally may flee there and find protection from the avenger of blood. When he flees to one of these cities, he's to stand at the entrance to the city gate and state his case before the elders of that city. Then they are to admit him into their city and give him a place to live with them. If the avenger of blood pursues him, they must not surrender the one accused because he killed his neighbor unintentionally and without malice aforethought. He is to stay in that city until he has stood trial before the assembly and until the death of the high priest serving at that time. Then he may go back to his own home in the town from which he fled. So they set apart Kadesh in Galilee, in the hill country of Naphtali, Shechem, in the hill country of Ephraim, Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the hill country of Judah. In the east side of the Jordan, Jericho, they designated Bezer in the desert on the plateau of Reuben, Ramoth in Gilead in the tribe of Gad, and Golan in Bashan in the tribe of Manasseh. Any Israelites or any alien living among them who killed someone accidentally could flee to these designated cities and not be killed by the avenger of blood prior to standing trial before the assembly. I bet most of us, if not all of us in this room, have played the game tag. Maybe it's been a while. Like, John, you probably haven't played this week. No, not this week. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you all play tag. And, uh, you know, somebody is it, and they're supposed to tag people. And, and there's different kind of versions of it. You know, sometimes there's freeze tag. Um, do you have tag backs or not? Um, you know, maybe you have to count to 10 until you can tag back. And, and sometimes, sometimes in tag, you designate a certain place as base, right, where you can, you can go and you can stop running, you can rest for a little while. And, and you know, you, you think about it, wouldn't it be wonderful if, um, if in the midst of just the craziness of life that kind of chases us down and wears us out, if there were some place like that, some place that's like base where you can go and, and not be chased anymore and you can just kind of rest for a while. Well, I think about these, these cities of refuge as being kind of like bases that uh, God told Israel to establish uh, throughout the land uh, in, in sort of a high-stakes game of tag. Um, and um, it, it probably seems a little weird to us, you know, in the U.S. in, in, in 2020. Um, but for its time, the practice was actually quite remarkable, you know, in an era where the basic legal maxim is an eye for an eye, um, which, by the way, was an advance over what was true in a lot of societies at that time and, and certainly before that, which was, you know, it's not an eye for an eye, it's, it's an eye for your both eyes. It gets you back more than you, than you got me. And, and you note this, these references to this, uh, this, this person called the, the avenger of blood, the avenger of blood. Um, that sounds to me like, you know, a character in a violent video game, you know? Um, or the title of a horror movie, right? Yeah. Avenger of Blood, Part 3. Rated R. <laughs> um, but, uh, but this Avenger of Blood, it was, a, it was a, and I, something that wasn't just in, for the Jews, but a lot of uh, the peoples practiced this, where um, if somebody in your family or your clan was killed, that the family appointed somebody to go track down the one responsible and to kill them. Um, kind of like your, your, your family hitman, you know? <laughs> Now, on a primal level, you know, maybe we find this a little bit attractive, <laughs> you know, especially if you got in your family somebody like, you know, Rambo or a young Clint Eastwood, right? Um, you know, just, just bypass the legal system and, and go right to, you know, sick Clint on them or something, you know? Um, now, of course, there's problems with this. Um, the significant problem with this is that, that human beings being sinners, you know, rarely is, uh, is the, the, the vengeance proportional, Right? I mean, you, I mean, with Clinton Rambo, is, is it ever just an eye for an eye? <laughs> you know, it's more like an eye for both eyes plus your leg and your head, right? Um, and, and you'll notice, too, these cities of refuge, they're not just get-out-of-jail-free cards for true villains, right? They make a distinction between 
people who, who kill accidentally versus people who kill intentionally. It's sort of like our, our distinction in our legal system between murder and manslaughter, right? There's a distinction made. Um, I, I think of, uh, there's a much milder level here, but um, when our kids were little, uh, sometimes around dinner time, uh, one of the, the children would, would throw something at another one, you know, like a shoe or a TV remote watermelon rind, you know. <laughs> and, and if they happened to hit the sibling, sometimes even if they didn't hit the sibling, you know, that, that sibling would then assume the role of the avenger of blood, right? And, uh, and then the, the one who threw it, the projectile, would, would try to hide behind dad, you know, as the, uh, the city of refuge. And, 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 and always he would say, it was an accident. It was an accident, right? Um, and, and sometimes we, we you know, I, I would protect them. And sometimes you just sort of let sibling justice run its course. <laughs> and, uh, uh, well, he alludes at the beginning here to how, you know, this was prescribed to do this, to have these cities of refuge before they actually came into the land under Moses. And uh, let me just read you some of the establishment of this and some of the hypothetical cases uh, for which these cities would be, be used. This is from Numbers chapter 35, verse 9. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when you cross the Jordan into Canaan, select some towns to be your cities of refuge, to which a person who killed someone accidentally may flee. They will be places of refuge from the avenger, so that a person accused of murder may not die before he stands trial before the assembly. And then a little further down, it, it gives some of these hypothetical cases. I'll look at verse 22. If without hostility, someone suddenly shoves another or throws something at him unintentionally <laughs> or without seeing him drops a stone on him that could kill him and he dies, then since he was not his enemy and did not intend to harm him, the assembly must judge between him and the avenger of blood according to these regulations. And, and it goes on. I don't know. Some of these hypothetical cases to me sound like, you know, my kids saying it was an accident, right? I mean, how do you shove somebody accidentally so hard that they die? <laughs> you know, you should shove them off a roof of a building or something, right? Um, you know, or just, oops, I didn't, didn't see you when I dropped that stone on your head. <laughs> you know? um, seems a little bit fishy to me. Um, but, you know, if you think about it, well, it, it may not be statistically common. Um, I, I bet you most of us here have known of somebody who died as a result of an accident caused by somebody else, right? I, I've, over the years, had probably a dozen or more uh, funerals for people who died accidentally. Um, and, and maybe some of us have even known, I, I've known several people who caused accidents in which others died. Um, I think of a, a young lady in my, my oldest daughter's uh, senior, their senior year of high school. She was in the class and uh, she was kind of tangentially uh, related to the church that we were part of at the time. She was uh, driving a car with, with three others from their senior class, and uh, she wasn't impaired. She stopped at the stop sign, uh, but she went through and she didn't see the truck that broadsided them. And two of the classmates were killed. She was fine, physically. <laughs> but, but I bet she, she's never been the same, you know. Certainly the families of those killed never been the same. And the question is, you know, where can somebody like that, that young lady turn? Where could she turn? And what about people who, who hurt others and mess up their own lives in, in, in other ways? You know, like, like say for a long, long time, you just are in the habit of, of, of spending a lot more money than you earn. One day you wake up and you realize, oh my goodness, my family and I, we're in this deep hole, you know? Or, or life gets turned upside down through no fault of your own or anybody else's, really. You know, you go into work one day and the supervisor says, oh, you know, with this COVID thing, you're downsized, you know? Or you go for a routine doctor appointment and you find out you have stage three cancer. You know, nobody's, nobody's fault, it's nothing personal, right? But it just, these things happen. You know, some messes are our own making, other messes are not of our making. But when our lives do get messed up in ways like these, it can make us scared, it can make us insecure, uh, not knowing you know, where to turn. So, so where is base, right? You know, where, where, where are those cities of refuge for us today? Um, it's not true for everybody, but hopefully for you, you can say your family is a refuge. Your family is a, is a place 
where no matter how badly you've messed up or, or how badly things have happened that have shaken you up, that you can go to your family and you'll be loved, you'll be accepted, you'll find, you'll find refuge there. And I believe God calls churches, you know, churches like ours, to be communities of, of refuge today. Why is that? Well, because we're called to bear witness to Jesus, who is the ultimate refuge, the only sure refuge for anybody. And students of Scripture um, do note how these cities of refuge are a pretty obvious foreshadowing of the person and the work of Jesus. And I'll, I'll note some of those comparisons in a moment here, but, but first let's think about some of the contrasts between the refuge that a person on the run could find in one of these cities and the refuge that a follower of Jesus can find, can find in him. For one, while these six towns were, were scattered all throughout the land, it still might be a long way for you to go to get to one, and it's a dangerous journey. The avenger could catch up to you before you got there. With Jesus, we can come to him from wherever we are, right? We don't have to take a long trip. We don't have to do that. And while the city of refuge is a great place for you, if you accidentally killed somebody, you hadn't done anything wrong intentionally, right? Jesus, 1 Timothy 1.15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save who? Sinners. Yeah. Sinners, including people who were very intentional about the wrongs they did. The, the premeditated gossip, right? The, the person who knew exactly what they were doing when they lied. The one who, who was, was very deliberate about being grumpy all morning when they got up. Mad at the world. <laughs> and, and so to be able to stay in one of these cities of refuge, you had to go to the city gates and to the elders, plead your innocence. By glorious contrast though, right? With Jesus, we, we come to him admitting our guilt. You're giving up any pretense of our own, our own righteousness. <laughs> well, as for some points of comparison, uh, this one line, verse 9, reminds us here that the cities of refuge weren't just for Israelites. They were for aliens in the land as well. They were for, for other people who lived among them, foreigners in the land. Likewise, Jesus Christ, friends, is a Savior not just for people who look like you and think like you, right? But for all people who will put their trust in him people of, of every racial and ethnic group, people who, people who have blue-collar jobs, have white-collar jobs, have ring-around-the-collar jobs, you know? People who, who love the Pittsburgh Pirates and President Trump, and people who don't, okay? You know, people who, who grew up in church, people who didn't. Again, the salvation found in Jesus Christ, friends, is for everyone, everyone who will turn to him as their refuge. And Old Testament scholars believe that an unusual feature about these cities of refuge is that unlike most of the towns of that era, the gates were not to be locked up at night. In other words, they were always to be open for people to come in, just as Jesus is always available to us. Right? Let me throw out one more key comparison point. In ancient Israel, if you accidentally killed somebody and you did not flee to a city of refuge, there was really no other provision for you. There wasn't. If you want to be safe, you had to run to one of these cities. Well, likewise, friends, if we want to be safe, if we want to be secure in the knowledge that our sins are forgiven, that, that we're in a relationship with God, that, that he loves us, that he wants us to be his, well, that then we must come to Jesus Christ by faith. We must. There's no other place, no other way. As Peter says in his sermon in Acts chapter 4, there's no other name given to men under heaven by which we must be saved, right? There is one uh, really untiring avenger who eventually chases down everyone, the avenger called death, right? You might live a really long time. You might live as long as Methuselah in the Bible or as long as Mary Tear, who, who died about 10 days ago here at age 104, you know. Um, but unless the Lord returns first, the avenger death will overtake us all. And the question becomes, is there any hope even then? Is there any hope then? The answer is yes, there is one. Only one, but there is one. His name is Jesus. 
one who said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. So really, in the most fundamental way, um, the equivalent for us of the cities of refuge are, are, are not any place, but it's a person. It's the person of Jesus. And yet this person, this person seems to meet us in particular places and among particular people in communities called churches, right? This is because today churches are, are those communities of people that are called together to witness to Jesus and to the refuge that's to be found in him. It's interesting, the book of Numbers tells us that these cities of refuge were to be established. They were all towns that were, were towns of the Levites. See, the Levites, unlike the other tribes, the other tribes were given chunks of land. The Levites were given, I believe it was 48 different cities and towns scattered throughout Canaan. And so the towns, the, the cities of refuge would be among the Levites' lands. Who are the Levites? The Levites are the, the, the keepers of the institutional religious life of Israel. They're the people responsible for leading the folks in worship and in service to the Lord, like churches are called to do today, right? So what about us? You know, what about our, our East Main Church? You know, are, are, we, are we a place, are we a community of people where folks can find refuge? Or people who are scared and on the run because they've really messed their lives up. Or, or people who've, who've just been battered by life, right? Can such people find safety? Can they find rest among us? Can we first of all, like those ancient cities, be communities of refuge for people who maybe, maybe even haven't killed somebody unintentionally, but who in other ways have unintentionally offended? <laughs> I sure hope so. <laughs> Because in any group of people, there are all kinds of opportunities to, uh, to, to hurt and to be hurt uh, by, by others. For example, you know, people who are, uh, who are really outgoing, sometimes just by being who they are, are really offensive to people who aren't, right? They'll wonder, you know, who's that loud mouth up there? You know? well, who does he think he is? And the outgoing ones sometimes, they're offended by the more reserved ones because they'll say, hey, how you doing? And the, the person will just kind of walk by and just, just look at the ground, you know? And the outgoing person wonder, you know, wait, what is not? You know, I think they're too good to say hi to me, you know? Unintentional offenses. I've even heard there's some churches where people get offended by what other people wear. Can you believe that? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> the, the point is, can, can we not become East Main Church of the Easily Offended? <laughs> okay? Let, let, let's not become that. Because being a place of refuge means I know that people are going to be forbearing with things about me that, that they're, not, they're not wrong, they're not sinful, but they're just, they're just maybe annoying, <laughs> you know? Um, and so I know that um, I can be myself and not worry about offending people because of my clothes or my taste in music or that I'm rooting for the Cleveland Browns or, or that I you know, put my Christmas lights up in August, you know? Um, but, but really, this is just a basic elementary level, right? Because again, remember, Jesus is not only a refuge for those who are a little bit odd or annoying or have offended unintentionally. He's a refuge for people who are utterly lost, people who are really messed up, people who don't just need our forbearance. They need forgiveness because we're sinners, right? To, to make this concrete, here, here's how you know if your church is a, is a city of refuge. If, um, if, if in yesterday's Allied News, your name and your picture are there, not because you made the honor roll, okay? You're in the police blotter section. That, that you're, you're, you know, you're, you're upset, you're embarrassed. And, um, and you go to bed Saturday night and you think, you know, I can't wait to get to church tomorrow. Because I know that that that's where people, I'm going to really be loved on there. I'm going to be pointing to the Lord there, you know? It means when I wake up and I realize that I've become a slave to, to habits that are killing me, that, that in my church family, you know, instead of, instead of finding, you know, you know, judge and jury, I'm going to find a group of people who's going to give me hope, going to give me encouragement, going to help me draw near to God for strength. It means that when your marriage is falling apart, right, that, um, 
You can find your church to be a community where the grace of God flows, where you get hope, you get healing, you get it in the form of hugs, you get it in the form of invites over to people's houses. You get refuge and rest as opposed to just getting a group of people who are very, very nice and are all just fine. <laughs> you know, how, how are you doing? I'm just fine, really. You, know, you don't find refuge and rest in that kind of an atmosphere. You just find your pain accentuated even more. Interesting, Deuteronomy chapter 19 says that the Israelites were to be especially attentive to building roads to these cities of refuge. And, and one commentator indicates that outside the Bible, there's sources saying that, that bridges were to be built over ravines that uh, were on the way to these cities, and that signs were to be posted at, at various major intersections pointing to them, and that in the springtime, when it was time to repair roads, the roads to these cities were supposed to be first on the list. In other words, that these cities were to be as accessible as possible for people. Right? Well, I'll leave you with the, the, the harder work of, of personal application, but let me just point the way by asking this. You know, what might it take? What might it take for, for our East Main Church, and what might it take for you, you personally in the world you know, that you, you walk in to be making Jesus Christ more accessible more accessible to people around you who so, so need the refuge that's found in him. Now, how might we be building bridges over the, the ravines that are between people and, and their Savior? How might we be fixing some of those roads that easily fall into disrepair because of kind of the storms of life or because of just plain neglect? Now, how might your life, how might my life become you know, clearer signs, signs that point people who are at various crossroads in life um, to the only real refuge, to Jesus. You know, I, I firmly believe, friends, that God does desire us to more and more uh, become a community of, of refuge for people, um, people who've messed up their lives badly, people who we might not deem socially acceptable, People who aren't bad, but just plain rub us wrong for whatever reason. And again, why does God call us to be a community of, of refuge? Well, how about because we witness to Jesus, who's the ultimate refuge for the world and for, for us, right? And so if you think about it, really the answer to the question of, is your church a community of refuge, is the same as the answer to the question, can people find Jesus there? Well, how about if we pray? Let's, let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the refuge that is Jesus Christ. We thank you, O God, that he is indeed the fulfillment of, of your word in, in the Psalms. It says that you, O God, are our refuge and our strength and our ever-present help. We thank you that that's who you are for us in the person of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we so desire to to share that with everyone because, Lord, this world wears us out and chases us down. Our, our own sins wear us out and chase us down. And so we ask you, God, that not only might we be drawing near to you day by day as that refuge that you are, but that we might also be in the business of, of building roads and bridges and, and posting signs that point those around us to you. We ask it all in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Friends, our affirmation of faith uh, all this month, because uh, hopefully in a month we, we learn it better, uh, is the Nicene Creed, which is longer than the Apostles' Creed, but it's also, it's, it's, it's richer in terms of what it tells us about Jesus. It's also more ancient. It is more universally used. And I know for some of you, it's not the version you memorized, <laughs> but uh, it's hopefully one that, uh, that a new generation can, can be learning here too. If you're able to do so, would you stand with me and affirm your faith with the Nicene Creed? We believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen, we believe, <laughs> we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, 
Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who was with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. And now, friends, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of God the Holy Spirit be yours this day and unto ages of ages. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs>